All right, the Reds, it's the second look, taking a second look at Chelsea 1, Liverpool 1 at Stamford Bridge. A draw that felt like a win because of the nature of Daniel Sturridge's brilliant goal, world-class goal in the 89th minute. So we're here to take a second look with me, Gareth Roberts, is Dan Morgan and Melissa Reddy. Um, we'll start off by looking at some of the facts and figures around the match. Uh, Liverpool obviously remain unbeaten in their opening seven matches of a Premier League season for the first time since 08 09, so that's nice, isn't it? But uh, Liverpool dominated possession 53 to 47%, dominated shots 13 to 10, dominated shots on target 6 to 4. Uh, both, both teams won four corners each, uh, and Liverpool were doing a bit more fouling than Chelsea were, which is all good by me, obviously. That's um, your favourite stat, I'm sure. That's your favourite stat, indeed. Um, it's also, as well, uh, Andrew Beasley highlighted this in his column for the Liverpool Echo today. It's only the fifth league game between sides from the big six in the last three years, where both teams had at least three opted to find clear-cut chances. Chelsea had four of those, Liverpool had three, but all seven were spurned. And he says spurned, but obviously Alisson saves two, uh, which is something we may come on to, depending on how the time goes with all this. But we have got a world-class goalkeeper now. Um, and then obviously two off the line as well. So uh, in, in terms of Liverpool shots... Um, so start, I mean, start just sort of by summing up, really, Dan. How did you feel about it? I mean, as I said at the top, because of the manner of the way we save the point, if you like, it almost feels like a victory. But now you've had a bit of time to reflect and you're looking at stats like that. Is there a part of you that thinks actually should have won it? I think the first thing that I felt uh, immediately after was that if we're all invested in this being a title challenging season for Liverpool, then you have to take what you deserve in games like this. Yeah. You have to, you, you, not only for what it would have done to us if we didn't get, or we got the, the defeat, we didn't get the points, what it would have done to Chelsea as well. Then beating us twice in a week, then putting out all the narrative all the time, that, oh, no, no, we're not involved in this title race. They'd have gone back in that changing room with three points on Saturday. They'd have been right up for it going into to the rest of the season. And it's just the way we inflicted that on them. And, and, and it's... It's a, a point of getting what you deserve and, and taking that point. And, and it did feel like a victory at the time. And looking back now, I had a little bit of time to dissect it. And what really surprised me, the, the more I look back on it, the more it felt like we were the home side. In that I was really surprised how deep Chelsea's back line was. I thought that they would push up. I thought they'd try and play the game through the middle of the park with us. And we'd just try and see these one-on-one -on -one battles all, all through the pitch and see who came out on top. And while that was the case... In some aspects of the pitch, I think Chelsea were happy to just drop deep. I think it's a factor in why David Luiz has such a good game because he gets to have all the pitch in front of him. Yeah. Um, and they, I think Klopp uses the phrase after a game, he says Chelsea picked their moments and they took the moment to score against Liverpool. And, and it, it felt like that. It felt like they were playing on that one mistake and it's a great goal. I think it got referenced in the post-match pint that if we score that goal, you're absolutely made up with it. I think they do everything right. Mm. And there's about four or five passages of play in it, which are really good. And it's it's something that you can't knock. So looking back at it now, I'm really happy how we played. I think it was a really hard game. I think it's gone a little bit under the radar just how much the midfield three had to work, even just to get back goal side. Most of the time, they had to work extremely hard. And I think it's uh, it's another thing Klopp can sell to the side going forward, character. Absolutely, and that, that's massive, isn't it, Mel? It's, it's, you know, the fact that we come from a position where you were watching it sort of thing and it just feels like it's not going to be our day. Yeah. You know, chance after chance, two off the line, Shaqiri missing that one, everything else. And you just, you, you know, by the time Sturridge is on the pitch, you're a bit like... It's not going to happen for us, and then and then he goes and does that. Yeah, it's the inevitability, isn't it? Because you've been through that game so many times. You've had the the massive chance creation and and all the waste that goes with it. So you know, as the minutes do tick on, and and the substitutions happen, you know, for many happen too late or or whatever. It it does play on your mind. But I watched both halves in a contrasting. Way and I think the game actually shaped up quite weirdly in that Liverpool have four attempts on goal before Chelsea have their first shot of any kind in the game, which comes on 22 minutes. Uh, David Luiz's ball over the top for, for William. And I started writing a tweet that said, Chelsea have shown now with their first shot in the game of any form, forget shot on target or inside the box, outside the box, just the first chance they had to, to form an attack, 
that they're in a very decisive mood today. You, you don't have to give them much, at, but they're mm. prepared to to work for it. And Liverpool have to realise that with that opening. Three minutes later, Hazard has the ball in the back of the... I didn't even get a chance to finish the tweet by the speed in which everything happened. And I think once Chelsea get that goal, it makes matters so difficult for Liverpool because Chelsea are a team very capable and very happy to fall back on their organisation. It's what they've known under their previous managers. It's what they've excelled in. It's what they've built titles on. And so the second half, uh, in the first half, Liverpool were exceptional in their one-on-one duels. The, the amount of battles they won all over the pitch was staggering. Really, really good. I thought in terms of everything, Liverpool were better, bar being decisive in the final third where Hazard is, you know, when you talk about a, a player that can define a game and decide a game, you think of people like him. Um, in the second half, it changed. I thought Chelsea were sensational out of possession. The work they did off the ball, Louise was man of the match by a mile, I thought, but it was so, so difficult for Liverpool to find the breakthrough just because of how determined Chelsea were without the ball. And if Sturridge doesn't look up and think to himself, I fancy it, yeah, I'm going to... I didn't see where a breakthrough was going to come from because even when Liverpool did get it right in the final third, you had two goal line clearances and you had Kepa make that incredible save... Uh, from Mane. The other thing I thought when I watched the game was I wanted to stand and applaud Liverpool's defending so many times in that match. I thought Virgil van Dijk and Joe Gomez, the latter especially, because I think often, you know, Joe Gomez gets slighted by the, oh, it's easy to look good next to van Dijk. I thought his turn of pace, his anticipation, everything was, was absolutely outstanding. And in a game like that where Chelsea are so happy to not have the ball and to counter and to be able to counter with William Hazard, I thought they were fantastic. And what a difference it makes having a world-class goalkeeper yeah. because without Alisson, Daniel Sturridge's goal means nothing at the end. He was superb as well. Well, I'm Daniel Sturridge, uh, 29 years old now. Um, we do like to sort of get into the stats on this show and I- I'm slightly taking the piss with this because uh, Daniel comes on the pitch his stats are one shot, one goal, one received pass. That, that's it. That's his stats. And he put it in the top bin. Uh, it's now 17 career Premier League goals as a substitute, which is good for third best in the in the competition's history, behind only Jermaine Defoe, who's got 24, and Giroud, who's got 19. It's also his 13th goal uh, from the bench for Liverpool, um, and that puts him... Ahead of Ryan Babel, who got 12, and now only behind David Fairclough, super sub, uh, who got 18. Um, now, on the bench and on this idea of being able to bring quality off the bench, I've just written something for the Anfield app that by the time this is out, will be on the website. But I was just talking in that about when you think about some of the options, or maybe you should do options in those air quote marks uh, that we've had off the bench in the past. So, rewind back to even early days of clock. He's bringing Corker off the bench and putting him yep. up front against Arsenal and against Manchester United. Go back to Rafa Benitez days, the 4-4 with Arsenal when Arshavan has that amazing night where Everton he touches goes in the back of the net. Rafa brings on El Zar that night yep. to try and turn around the match. Yep. So the idea now that we've got a fella who has got multiple caps for England, that's got the record that I've just mentioned, and he's, he's just the bench player. If Sturridge is happy with that, which it seems he is, he's at peace with it. This is a brilliant weapon for Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah, a couple of things for me. I mean, it, it, another example as well, just going back to that, is if you remember Rodgers when we played Chelsea away in 13-14, brings Brad Smith off the bench. Yeah. And everyone wondered at the time, was it some kind of statement, what, what was happening? Yeah. Literally, we had, we had no one sub. And it's, it's the notion of only having one sub from the bench is something that's been relevant for us since Klopp come through the door. One, one, one relevant sub who can impact on a game. And I think it's easy looking at that in-game, but, you know, opposition analysts are looking at that beforehand, going, if you're up on 70 here, yeah, these have got nothing. If they make him, then you've got a plan for him when he mm-hmm. comes on the pitch. But after that, they're either throwing a kid on, or like you said, they're throwing a centre-half up front or something. And, and the notion that 
we can bring Daniel on with five to go after already bringing Naby Keiter in and Shakiri on yeah. the pitches. It just football matches sometimes are built around um, momentum and and narratives. And if you're banging the door down, if you're pressing, if you're camped inside that opposition third, but you're bringing on quality as well, you're you're able to signal that intention by showing it of who's coming off the bench and who's going off. Then it just adds to the fact that if you're in that Chelsea stand, if you're if you're sat there as a Chelsea fan, you're thinking, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And whilst Liverpool's final pass wasn't right, the pass before the pass wasn't right, a lot of the time on Saturday, you're still seeing Daniel Sturridge coming off after you've got used to Kaita coming on, after you've got used to Shakiri coming on and going, oh, what if? And then what if happens? And I think it was dead interesting what Klopp said about Daniel in that he said, we, haven't, we no longer have to make him feel like we have to adapt how we play for him. You know, and, and that has to be managed around his body and his, his physical state and his fitness and stuff like that. But at the same time... There's just there's just a lot more of Daniel just being completely bought into what's yeah. being asked of him now, and, and maybe look, I I absolutely love his self confidence more than anyone else, and I always say I'd rather have a Daniel Sturridge on the pitch than a Divock Origi. In ter- forget ability, just in terms of someone who can carry the shirt, he will back himself one hundred percent all the time. But now you can clearly see that he feels that he's coming to the squad this summer and said, what do you need me to do? What is it you need me to do? And I don't think he's never really done that, but I think he's always had a thing in the back of his mind of, well, I should be playing every week here and I should I should have things in some ways built around what I'm good at. And it, it can't always work that way, especially with his fitness. But it's it's great and it's great going forward. And it's it's still that the fact that Liverpool still got a very strong bench even after we make the three subs. So if we had another sub to make and we needed to shore up a little bit in the game, You've still got them substitutes mm. there, so it's it's good. It, it's 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 impactful on the game, and that's what we wanted. It also feels like as well that Sturridge can sort of hold his head up high now and sort of say, "I'm legitimately a Liverpool player who's achieved something." That's his fiftieth uh, Premier League goal for Liverpool, so he's now alongside Fowler, Gerrard, Owen, Suarez, Torres, and Coit as as a ma- in managing that feat. And there has been, you know. There's been doubts about him at times. There's been people who constantly talk about his fitness and all that sort of stuff. But he showed again, as not that, you know, give him a chance. And well, when he's doing that, he's, he's proven that he's a world-class finisher yet again. Yeah, I, th- I don't think there, there ever has been any question marks over his talent and his capabilities and, and quality, especially when it comes to, to finishing. I mean, we all saw firsthand, especially in 2013-14, the variety in yeah. his finishing. Um, it was always, obviously, physicality and then mentality in terms of he hadn't, he'd not he gotten used to the fact that post-Suarez, it was the Daniel Sturridge show. Everything relied on him when he didn't play. And, and we spoke about this during pre-season and the fact that it was only ever going to work between Liverpool and Sturridge, if he came to the realisation that he has to be part of the whole and the whole doesn't revolve around him, he's not the focal part anymore. It's now more collective. And this pre-season, you could tell everything. You could you could see the change. You could see the happiness. You could see he was content in, in just being part of Liverpool, not having to be the main man, not having to be in the first 11, but just being there. And... I think going to West Brom and seeing how different life is away from the club, that you can even go somewhere like that and not be the main man. But also the fact that this is the last year of his contract. So, you know, if he does want to go somewhere nice or it would be great for him to have a really top season, either to say to Liverpool, listen, I'm happy to do this again for you next season or for the next two years, or to say to a perspective club or to have a choice of really good perspective cl- clubs that he can go to because let's be honest Daniel Sturridge should have not been anywhere close to West Brom but he needs to give himself that opportunity and in the meantime Liverpool benefit from it I thought as well it wasn't just Sturridge you know Keita came on ha- made an impact Shakiri came on should have scored he, he literally he did everything right but just opened his body up too much and and the finish is wrong, but he, he looks at, he anticipates, he calls for the pass and everything. Um, and I think we can get sucked into this idea of 
Shakiri must start now because he keeps having an impact or Keita must start. But by having game changes on the bench, what you're able to do is you're able to give yourself a foundation. You're able to be really tight, especially in, in games like Saturday where you're up against very, very good opposition who have a, you know, exceptionally strong midfield, most especially. Um, and, and I think it's good to be able to bring on people to affect the game rather than always thinking you have to have all your, your game changes in the starting lineup. Um, so it gives Klopp flexibility in terms of, you know, shape and, and ta- what he can do later on in the game. Um, I also thought it was quite interesting that the, when they came on, it that nothing much needed to change. They no. adapted quite quickly to the situation in terms of Chelsea being very good, uh, out of possession, Liverpool having all the ball, Liverpool needing to force the issue, absolutely needing to force it. And I thought they came on and it was like, okay, this is what we're about. It was a really high-speed game, high-caliber game. And often as a sub, if you come into that, it's a very difficult situation to find yourself because you're starting cold and everybody else is in in the heat of the moment. So I thought... um, they adjusted pretty well. It, it, it was a great game. And I think based on the first 20 minutes, I, I was wondering to myself, how are Liverpool not so comfortable in this game on the scoreboard? But by the end, when it gets to Sturrid scoring, it's that sense of relief. Because I think so many times in the past, Liverpool have performed exceptionally and have left with nothing. And even though for large parts of the game you felt like Liverpool had enough to to win it. Chelsea are phenomenal. They were at Stamford Bridge. And for Liverpool to be able to do what they did there, create so many chances, I mean, force defenders into goal line clearances and and stuff like that, I, I think it shows how good Liverpool were. And I'm very, very happy that they didn't come back without anything to show for it. Yeah, lots of positives from the game. Uh, Neil has been on his tactics board as ever, uh, taking a closer look at what Liverpool did and what Liverpool did well in this game. What a game of football. I do all the silly stuff with the counters and we talk a lot about the way in which football teams are set up by managers and the decisions they make. Let's be really clear about this. Klopp and Sarri can set up and make the decisions they make because of the sheer quality of the footballers at their disposal. This isn't just some sort of conversation of what you can do with Premier League footballers versus Championship footballers. This is arguably a conversation with what you can do with two of the best sides in the world, top 10 in the world, versus what you could do with, say, a side that comes 7th, a side that comes 8th, a side that comes ninth. That's such an important distinction to make because so much of this football match happens so quickly and with such tactical fluidity. It's difficult at times to work out what was managers and what was players or what was both, what was information handed to players at half-time, who did what, where and when. What we can say with certainty is how Liverpool set up. And it was such a flat midfield three again. We keep talking about this, but this is why, for instance, Fabinho is finding it hard to get into this side, being a more traditional deep-lying midfielder. The three of them played, if you see the average position in terms of influence, very much in this line here in the first half. And Liverpool, on points, had the better of the first half. Chelsea ended up with two fantastic chances, but Liverpool again and again found a way through. So here's, here's Milner, here's Henderson, here's Wijnaldum. You can see the full-backs, you can see the defenders. What was interesting was how much Chelsea took to Wijnaldum in. Sorry, um, William in. They had Azpilicueta patrolling much of that flank. Kovacic played really close to Hazard with Alonso looking to come and join where possible when they were on top. That's what you got to see. Kante sort of doing little bits and pieces in here. Second half... What I liked was James Milner. Liverpool were struggling really to get Robertson up and involved in the game. So Liverpool's second half, Robertson ended up quite high and Milner came and sat different bits and pieces around there and then left them in there a little bit more. It was as though he himself had realised there's all this space to work with, all of these little bits that we can do here. And that gives these players a problem because what they don't want to do is they don't want to release Mane Well, we saw Mane get in because you've got to do something about Milner and about Robertson. They don't want to create passing lanes where suddenly Liverpool can find routes into Firmino. He can come in here and influence. He can do his little bits. They didn't want to do that either. So you ended up in a situation where Milner has a really influential half around this area of the pitch, which freed up these other footballers and allowed Liverpool to become creative. 
it's noticeable so much of what's good about Liverpool's play in that second half comes through this left-hand side. That was the difference Milner made. Was it his manager? Was it he himself? We'll never know. We don't need to know. But what we do know is the quality that was on show, both in terms of speed, in terms of bravery, in terms of touch, but in terms of brain power. What a set of footballers. OK, thanks very much to Neil Atkinson there. Um, we're going to have a chat now about Mo Salah. Uh, lots of focus on the fact that he was substituted. Lots of focus on the fact that his stats aren't quite what they were last season and his shot conversion isn't quite what it was last season yet. Um, it almost seems like someone somewhere wants to generate crisis talk when Liverpool are joint top of the league. But, but you know, not, we're not doing conspiracy theories. Uh, Salah, in this game, four attempts... Two on target, two off target, one big chance, which is the effort cleared off the line by Rudiger. Um, I've pulled together some stats there about uh, how everyone else who plays up front is currently performing in the league. Um, and looking through them, Mo's stats currently, um, if I can get to the right page, here we go. So this is according to the BBC. Three goals, one assist. This is obviously just in the Premier League. 195 minutes per goal. 60% of his shots on target, which sounds pretty decent to me, um, especially when you start to look around at some of the other... Jamie Vardy, 54% of his shots are on target. Ryan Fraser, 57. Mane, 61. Lukaku, 69. Glenn Murray, 56. Uh, Nautovic, who's getting lots and lots of praise at the moment, 50%. Although there are, you know, there are obviously some who are ahead of him right now. Sterling, 77%. Eden Hazard, 82% of his shots on target currently. Aguero, though, 46. So, I mean, that's obviously not the only indicator of how you're playing, but it kind of backs up what I'm hearing a lot of people saying, which is they're not particularly worried because he's still getting in, you know, the old cliche, getting in the right places at the right times. He's on the end of things. He's maybe, like you said in the first half, taking the wrong decision at times. There was the one where he tries to play Firmino in, yeah. and I think you'd hear Klopp talk afterwards about how he was a bit disappointed in that because he thought he'd engineer the situation where he can get a shot off and then doesn't take that. And I think it was almost that little mini crisis in confidence he saw there where he thought, I'm, I'm going to take him off here, it's not his day. But in general, worried? No, not at all. The, the Firmino one, if it comes off, it's, it's a great ball. Yeah. There's 90% chance he puts it away. So the other two, he has two carbon copy attempts, doesn't he, in the first half. One he puts on target, which is quite tame. The other one goes wayward. That's early in the game. You can put it down to him getting his sighter. The other one, he goes around the keeper. He's on his weaker foot. Ruger gets back in really well. He's under pressure from the get-go. The first touch is brilliant. And for all the narrative around it, you know, people, it's easy to forget games of football. He plays the Southampton game with a smile on his face. You know, and he, he looks most of the time like he's still enjoying playing football. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's the thing for me of, I just I take reassurance from last season in that it wasn't until around Christmas that he really started to catch fire and catch everyone's eye. And he might just be that type of player. I've not looked at his, his stats that deep in terms of when he, if you like, warms up into a season, at what point does he hit the ground running? Does he does he get better the longer it goes? Is he someone who has a spell in the middle? And, and all players have spells during mm -hmm. seasons. So there's that. And the other thing for me as well is if you I mean if you rewind back even further, something like the Spurs game. There's three or four times where he should have been put in and he's got what's the equivalent of an own goal. So I think it's 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 misgiven to judge him purely based on numbers and, and yeah. the likes of Sky and that will do that because it's it's a headline for them. I, I scanned through a headline on Twitter today saying what's up with Mo Salah and it was a Sky piece, you know, and that that's purely for clicks. We know that. We're not daft enough. But I think that I think that there's there's a part of his game where it doesn't have to be this you know, this rip-roaring Hattrick Roy that overs performance because we're still winning games of football yeah. and he's still contributing to that and he's still a danger. He's still someone who teams set up to account for more than anyone else you could argue in this Liverpool side. So the manager will keep telling him to play his game, will keep being happy with him in training because I'm sure he's training fine and it'll come. I'm not bothered at all. Well, he's asked about it, isn't it, about, about whether Salah is happy right now and Klopp says, well, of course he's not because... 
he wants to be scoring and, and that's the type of player he is. And he said, but that's what I'm here for. That's what that's why you have a manager. I'm gonna, he almost said like he's going to sit down with him, if you like, and talk about it maybe in some way. So we don't know what goes on there. We're not privy to that. But again, like the same question to you. Worried in any way about Mo Salah right no, now? No, I'd be worried if Salah was hiding on the pitch. Mm. And he's not. He's doing everything. His chance creation is exceptionally high. I don't think any player in the league has more shots on target than him. His key passes are excellent. His defending numbers are great. His goal count is only, I think, two or three shy from at the same stage last season. So really nothing to worry about. I think it's unfair to speak about him in isolation. I don't think the front three um, have clicked as a group as yet, which I think people rewrite history because they didn't click at the stage last season either. It took a while. I think it was mid-October, sort of like second week of October towards the end of that second week where you then started to look at this Liverpool side and mm -hmm. and think, yeah. look at that attack. It, it wasn't from the absolute get-go. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think we scored 17 goals after nine games last season. We've got 19 at the moment. We've conceded seven this season at the same stage last season. I think we conceded 16. So Liverpool as a unit have improved and that front three, when they do eventually catch fire, they will. In, because of the quality they all have, the players the, and the personalities they all have, they're all determined to succeed. They, you know, for themselves, but also for this football club. And so when they marry the steel Liverpool have showed in, in midfield and the strength that we have at the back now, it's going to be sensational to watch. Um, the other thing about Salah is we had the same talk about Sadio Mane through a period last season yeah. and Klopp didn't make a big fuss of it. He didn't even actually have a massive chat with, with Sadio about it. He just said, don't overthink things. You're, you're a very good player. You're doing everything right. The only element that's going wrong is you're, you're overthinking it. You're too much in your own head. Stop that. Don't worry about what people outside are saying or what their expectations of you are. Worry about what you need to do. You know, my opinion, the coaching staff's opinion, your teammates' opinion. And I think for Salah, because he's desperate, you know, to do so well, to sort of compete with himself and, and what he did last season. He is perhaps not operating off instinct as, as much as he should be because, you know, he is applying it in every situation. He's thinking about two or three different outcomes that could possibly happen. But I, I think it will become natural again, not just for him, but all three of them. And, and when that happens, I think that's when the rest of the league start to really panic uh, because, you know, after Napoli is, is the City game and if anyone's watched All or Nothing, when you see the clips of Guardiola speaking about Liverpool's front three, I think that's when you realise just what gold we have up front there. Absolutely. So a Liverpool that hasn't clicked is what we all seem to still be saying and yet Liverpool are joined top of the Premier League so that's alright isn't it. If you want more chat about the Chelsea game, about the games to come as well, uh, do check out theanfieldapp.com. Subscription podcast, free podcast, loads of writing on there as well which is really good. Um, and loads more videos to come as well. Uh, there was a post-match pint at the weekend which was particularly interesting it's fair to say. Uh, not often that I've done a video where there's literally a fight going on in the background, wow. but that's what <laughs> happened. Uh, so give that a watch. Unfortunately, it doesn't feature fight footage, uh, but it does feature us watching fight footage. And uh, Steve McManaman's bar. And, 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 and chat about Steve McManaman's bar as well. So it's all there. So check it out. And if you do like the, the YouTube channel, give it a subscribe, tell your mates, give it a share and all that kind of thing. That has been the second look. Thanks to Dan, thanks to Mel. We could have gone on forever because these two were dead interesting. But, we, you know, the camera's going to switch off or something, I think, in a minute because Sam's waving at me. That's been the second look.